some formalities I'd have to go through to where uh, her name will, or their name will go to town council and then get sworn in and all you'll hear about kind of the procedures after that. But um, so our potential number is Deborah. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting. Um, how long ago did we meet now? Two weeks ago, however many weeks ago now. It, I, the time is flying for me. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you want to go ahead and say a little thing about yourself or anything. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> I'm relatively new in Amherst. We, uh, my wife and I arrived two years ago, and um, I've been an activist um, for the, my entire adult life, about 40 years, and very um, civically involved, particularly around um, civil rights, LGBTQI rights, anti-racism work, police accountability work. I came from pa Portland, Oregon, uh, most recently, lived there for 10 years, lived in Washington, D.C. for 26 years, and grew up in New York City. So um, I like to be involved, and I'm coming out of an incredibly overwhelming um, two-year stint at my day job that I'm leaving, <laughs> and I have some spaciousness coming to my life. So I applied um, because when I saw the mission of this commission, I thought, oh, that's my personal mission statement too. So that's my bear. Yeah, thank you for that. And then uh, we'll just go around and introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Philip. I think I have already introduced myself to you, uh, but yes, I'll go ahead and just popcorn it to Ronnie. Um, I'm Ronnie, and I may have been enamored even less time than you. We're at one and a half years now, I think. Um, yeah, I also have worked uh, quite a bit in human rights, but particularly in the international context. Uh, I had a lot to do with the convention, the creation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and studied with its author, who taught at Harvard Law, but I also took that same course with him at Tufts, um, and then participated in its enforcement by representing that convention uh, on behalf of Save the Children. Um, so I led that whole thing. And um, I haven't been very active in the US per se at all, uh, except that locally I did get very involved in police activity in my last um, place where I lived for 29 years. But because I worked internationally, I wasn't as consistently engaged, but I did get the police training and the use of gun and all that kind of stuff. So I'm very interested in um, that whole question of how the rights of citizens, citizen, residents, I guess you don't say citizens anymore, res of people interacts with the rights of police because where I lived before, Maryland has this whole uh, police rights. I forget what it's called now. It's slipped out of my, slips from my mind at this moment, but there is this whole thing about police officers' rights that doesn't exist in Massachusetts, didn't exist in Maryland, but during the time that I lived there, they got rid of it and got it back on the books. And when you have police officers' rights, it has tremendous implications for transparency for regular people. Uh, in other words, not much. So anyway, I'm very interested in all of this uh, and I've worked on it and I also studied it on the as a graduate student. That's the long introduction of me, sorry. I tend to talk, that's the other thing about me. It's hard to stop me, sorry. It's all right, <laughs> Oliver. Hmm, sorry, uh, hi, my name's Laverne Kelly. Um, I'm new to the board, I've only been on the board for since December, and welcome, potentially. Tyler? I'm Tyler, uh, I'm a student at Amherst College. I'm currently studying abroad in Geneva. I'm double majoring physics and law. Uh, I don't have nearly as impressive a resume as Ronnie, um, but, yeah, I've mostly been studying international law for this last semester and quite a bit of international human rights law in there uh, to the point where I now can confidently say that I know a bit about uh, constitutional rights, uh, international human rights, international humanitarian law, which has its own subset of international humanitarian rights, at least I would argue it does, um, about five different conventions, uh, 
all of the stuff with the American Convention on Human Rights that the U.S. is sort of technically probably supposed to follow but completely ignores. Uh, ICCPR, which the U.S. very blatantly ignores. Just all of this different stuff, and half the time I get them confused and get all the jurisdictions mixed up. And most of the time, um, it's just between two laws that the U.S. government doesn't follow. So, oh well. <laughs> Thank you, Tyler. Jen. Hi, I'm Jennifer Moisten. I'm the Assistant Director for the Office of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and I am one of the uh, staff liaisons for the Human Rights Commission. And Pamela? So there's no need for me to introduce myself because Deb and I and Jennifer met a couple of months ago, so she knows who I am and what we do. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Deb, for joining tonight. And uh, sorry, you, we are not made in a quorum yet, but we'll see what happens as this progresses. Um, are we allowed to do public comment? Is there even anyone in the public? No? Okay, so then we will skip right on into that. Um, member updates. Uh, I could give you an update on the affordable housing trust so what we are trying to do with them is hold together a listening session um, to where it brings together the town's affordable housing trust the town's um, pub board of public health um, the human rights commission the community safety and social justice committee and am i missing anyone jen or is that it so these four groups are going to come together um, and the plan is to broaden the conversation of affordable housing in Amherst to kind of narrow in what is actually the problem. And so we've heard from kind of different people at various times on this commission um, come and kind of with frustration about um, affordable housing in Amherst from arrays of dealing with landlords, um, dealing with just what people would consider affordable housing. And so there hasn't really been much of an effort on um, the town side to fully kind of grasp the problem and understanding. And so that's what this these commissions or committees and commissions are trying to do is come together to have a space where residents can come in speak their mind freely, kind of give general um, topics and ideas so then that way we can go back and report out to town council to be like, this was a heavy topic that was talked about in a array of groups. And this is something you should definitely look at from residents' perspectives. And so that's kind of the idea of the space that um, in its initial planning is trying to be planned on um, June 20th from 6.30 to 8 o'clock at the Bang Center, so an in-person um, meeting. And again, so when we have that more narrowed out, Jen, is actually the flyer out yet or no? Yes? All right, well, let's make sure if we could email the flyer to the commission and that way everybody can kind of spread it out to their various groups to get people's attention on it. I would just also add that I don't have the questions in front of me, but there are three questions that are being asked. And so you can kind of prepare yourself for the topics for the conversation ahead of time by answering the three questions or having the three questions, which if you go to when I send the flyer, there's a QR code that brings you to the Affordable Housing Trust page. And um, there you can fill you can answer the three questions all, you know, all submissions are anonymous, so that's really good too. Um, but those basically, there's just three or four questions to try to keep it structured so people will be broken up into groups at the event and answer the three questions. And so, so we would like to have childcare and translation services if needed. There are some funds mm -hmm. for that. Yeah. So the main people spearheading that is our affordable housing trust. Um, are they a committee, commission, committee um, in town and we are co-sponsoring with them. Any questions on that, anything? 
No. Alrighty. Anybody else have any other report outs? Any members want to say anything? Not seeing any. All right. So the next agenda item is uh, last week we spent a array of hours with each other. <laughs> any uh, anything's kind of up for game. I mean. Um, we don't have, I think, everybody that was on that call here, but kind of general takeaways, anything you want to talk about, anything you want to say about our town council meeting, our joint town council meeting with CSS JC. Tyler? Yeah, uh, I think we like almost made it to it, but we didn't quite really get to talking about the uh, planned youth empowerment center very much and that was kind of the like one thing that I was sort of waiting to get brought up since I think that that now sort of needs to be looked at in the context of the news that's come out on Amherst Regional Middle School uh, so the article in the graphic of course the one that uh, kind of broke the whole thing open and uh, a full-blown Title IX complaint, which I haven't really heard of those against middle schools before, which kind of emphasizes the gravity of it that now it's going to a federal agency responsible for enforcement of one of this country's most serious uh, non-discrimination directives. And of course, um, that article has now been picked up by the uh, Hampshire County Gazette, and I'm sure some of the other news outlets have picked it up as well. Um, obviously, it's a huge issue for uh, parents and, of course, a massive issue for the kids impacted by it. So I think in the context of the Youth Empowerment Center, we probably do need to be making sure that this is something that's going to be actually empowering, um, something that needs to facilitate safer spaces for uh, kids going through this sort of stuff, because these are middle schoolers and it's that sort of thing is going to have a massive impact on them for years uh and i think also we probably need a separate conversation about amherst regional middle school because the scope of these rights violations are just i can't think of very many laws that weren't violated at some point or another by what they did because they uh broke separation of church and state so that's first amendment right there um Obviously, we've got massive discrimination and they're facilitating bullying. So now we're starting to see a bit of negligence, honestly. Um, and the I also found the graphics on the, the graphic uh, article a little troubling because they have graphics of torn down uh, posters for clubs uh, for LGBTQ plus students in Amherst Regional Middle School, a torn down poster supporting trans rights. Uh, and I'm somewhat concerned that they didn't really talk about it in the article, but I'm somewhat concerned if there could also be a broader freedom of speech issue, which would be a pretty big deal. I mean, that would end up landing in another First Amendment violation, Tinker v. Desmois. Uh, so I think, honestly, this kind of needs a full investigation into it. Uh, and I think that that might be something that some of the school oversight committees, potentially even um, county level or state level. I don't really know how all the schools end up being funded and who ends up ultimately being the buck stops here for it, but there definitely need to be investigations into that. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And I think it's important um, to highlight the Title IX um, investigation that it is going to be a separate body outside of the school. So I think that that is a, a great move on that end just for transparency and less biased on that end rather than have a school committee or anybody else affiliated with the school investigate. Ronnie? I'm just going to say, Tyler, that that was extremely well stated and ditto to everything you said. I was outraged to, to read about it. But anyway, yes, yes, yes. I think you're completely on target. I had another comment, just a reflection on the what we the big meeting that we had. I thought that because it was so long and the process was so deep, and in a way it had to be because I think the town council felt like 
um, they weren't, we were telling them they weren't listening to us and they wanted to be sure they listened. And I think it was set up to make sure we all got to talk, but we had 25 people and seven big agenda items. Um, so that I think that's one of the reasons important things got left be, left out because I know that I myself after 11 o'clock, I couldn't even think. So on reflection, I think we missed like some of the very specific kinds of recommendations that could be done without all this politicking and without budget changes and union recommendations. And I don't know if there's any way at this point to go back and say, for example, you know, the recommendations from the LEAP report, you know, things like um, stop consent searches. Okay, so you don't need to negotiate with the union to do that. You don't need a budget revision to do that. You can just decide you're going to do that. So I think there are actions like that uh, that sort of got lost that are very doable, you know, quick wins, things you do, I mean, you can do immediately because you want to and you don't need any other bigger change to happen. So I was thinking of the consent searches and also the low level, what they call the low level and pretextual stops. You know, the LEAP report is very clear. It gives you these things you can do today and we lost that. And I would really like to find a way to get back to that because there are those kinds of things. And then at the same time, we were talking about these bigger issues of racism and so on. Um, so it all got muddled in that and we lost the opportunity to do the specific. And maybe we should have put these in our part of the report because from our standpoint, you know, there is a violation of rights happening that we need to be able to address. And I think if we look at it just that way, it's pretty clear that there are things they can do. There are more they could do. Um, so I guess I do have a, I felt bad that we didn't get to these small things. And I'm wondering if there's any way to get that out to them at this point. Yeah, to answer that, I mean, I know that at CSSJC or other groups, we can always like write a letter, co-sign a letter and or just write one for the Human Rights Commission and just send that out like very specific, like in the LEAP report line item, this is what we would like to see. Doesn't seem like it needs a negotiation. Could this happen like tomorrow and see what the response is? I think that that's probably going to be the best way, but I do want to uh, point out and circle back around to your um, first part of it, that there was a lot of politicking going around it. I think that that's kind of the nature of these topics and this conversation, like even with trying to set up this um, co-meeting, the first suggestion was that we do it at a town council meeting where they have under other agenda items and a lot an hour time frame for this conversation and um, the co chairs of both committees countered back that we didn't think that that would be feasible just given the nature of all of our other conversations and topics with them that probably a two hour to three hour long conversation with the only agenda item being that topic would be appropriate for this conversation. Otherwise, we're just kind of setting ourselves up for failure to be later into the night because if that was the case, we wouldn't have started until eight o'clock at night with that conversation. And that would have dragged on till the early hours in the morning. And then to your point, really not narrowing on the specifics of what's in the actual report. So I do think that these conversations need to be really looked at and in a way that is a little more productive into getting what it is. And I will recognize on the town council's end, and this is, I guess, I don't know on whose fault of the motion, but on whoever on the motion, that town council didn't get to discuss any of the things from um, the town manager report until that night. So that was their first time and their first take at discussing it in an open public forum. So that may not have been the best setup there because we were getting their raw reactions to the report as well. And we had the benefit of meeting two times prior to kind of fluff out some stuff and get things more narrowed in. So I think that overall, 
what I would suggest is that if we have another meeting and um, I, I, it's no secret, I think maybe uh, Deborah, I don't think that I shared this, but I will be leaving the commission in July, that if it moves forward in a way, I would suggest that we have a meeting where it's only that line item or like specific item, just like we did. And also, I really do appreciate the way that the meeting was held and ran. I think um, Michelle did a great job at giving space for the committees to speak. And I do have to say on town council, um, President Lynn's part for her ability to step away and allow that to happen. I will recognize that was a great leadership move on her end as well. So I do appreciate the way the meeting was ran. I just do think that, yes, there needs to be a way to where some conversations that were also brought up, dragged on a little bit longer than probably they should have. And we might, we might have got to the youth empowerment. So maybe having a way that co-chairs or the facilitator can narrow in and get us back on track to, okay, this conversation can happen at a later date. Let's narrow in on the youth empowerment center or whatever it, it be. So anyways, long-winded answer to all that. I, I would be in full support of, um, I mean, can't vote right now, but um, of a letter coming about to kind of narrow in on what we would like to be more specific about on the leap report. Anybody else have any other comments about? Yeah, my hand is up. I just wanna say is I, I'm hearing multiple layers of complexity. One is, and forgive me, I'm new here. Are you saying that the Go town ahead. council actually makes decisions about what police officers can and can't do? I mean, in most municipalities, there's a police commissioner. Sometimes that commissioner is the mayor. I don't understand why that discussion was happening with the town council. Right. So uh, they go through a collective bargaining agreement and Pamela, please step in if I misspeak at all. Um, and so that is done through negotiations of their union. And is it the town's attorney or? I'm sorry to interrupt, but Ronnie said something about a host of issues that could be addressed that were outside the scope of the collective bargaining agreement. FYI, I'm also a lawyer and I worked in the labor movement for many years. <laughs> so I, I there's a lot of things that I do know. I just don't know what how things work in Amherst yet. So we don't, don't, you don't need to educate me now. I'm just trying to say that it would be helpful if I come on board to get clarity about where authority um, lies for different decisions in your system, in our system, and um, clarity about why certain discussions are happening at the town council that maybe don't even belong there and where that's gonna add uh, time and uh, bureaucracy where it doesn't need to be. So in addition to those items that could be put in a letter, like is there a decider other than town council who could move more efficiently? That's my question. So the um, answer is that town manager when the police chief would have the ability to make those decisions. And it um, this matter was before the town council in, uh, in part because um, uh, members of the community were dissatisfied with the actions of the town manager and the police chief following the July 5th incident. Um, but I, I say that in part because, as Ronnie has pointed out, the LEAP report predates that. Um, and all of the town council members, I believe, have seen the LEAP report in all of those um, reports. So they have access to that um, to that Im information. I um, So I... I would say that I think it was primarily before the town council um, because uh, community members, members of the two joint committees wanted to stress and emphasize their uh, points on these various initiatives where they felt like town council was not directing the town manager to act in an expeditious way. Thank you. So, just in terms of onboarding, like the LEAP or LEAD report, I'd love to see that. I'd love to see some kind of org chart that uh, 
describes decision-making authority and who's accountable to whom. And um, I'd love to know, maybe this needs a conversation, um, what, what the scope of authority is at the lowest level possible that so that we can push our agenda um, as quickly as possible. So I can, uh, I'll make a note to send you links to the uh, website for the CSSJC. All of those reports are there online and also um, the town charter. So the town form of government changed and Jen will have to fill in on the exact date. Has it been three years or four? They were voted in on 2018 to start in 2019. Yeah, um, so prior to the change in government, it, there was um, a town meeting and, um, and board of, do they have board of selectmen? Yeah. And so now they have a new structure, which models the structure um, authorized by law in Massachusetts. So that even though we're the town of Amherst, we have a city form of government, which, um, so we don't have a mayor, but we have the town manager and then we have elected town council. So the, you know, as you know, in theory, the town council is the, is the legislative branch and the town manager is the executive branch. But, you know, in a small town, um, those roles really get a little bit muddied. And, but the uh, in November, there was a, a resolution from the town council requiring the town manager to provide an update on these items. And that is also why it was back in the town council. And we, Jen and I are happy to meet with you and give you, you know, more information and all the reports and stuff. Thank you. I just, I think it might be helpful for context wise and you can access this information or we can send it to you either way or both, right? But so after in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, the town council had, uh, put together for the town manager to create a community safety working group that was going to look at policing and how policing could be better. And out of the, the CSWG's work came about six or seven recommendations. And so two of those recommendations have come to fruition, which was um, an alternative police department, which is the Community Responders for Equity, Safety and Service, and a DEI department. So those two things came. What else is on? The other recommendations are a youth empowerment center, multicultural center, uh, creating an anti-racist local government, right? So that all employees, but particularly it is noted for the police department to become anti-racist. And then, um, uh, and then I think the rest of the recommendations really are reflected of the police department, like to to stop pretextual, uh, I don't even know if I said that right, pretextual yeah. stops. And um, so the CSWG hired two consultants. One was the LEAP, which is the law, can't remember all of the acronyms because we have way too many acronyms in this team in this town, but um, so LEAP. And so they came and they basically, they went through all of the policies and procedures of the police department and kind of came up with and, and, and analyzed like what could be, what changes would be beneficial. And part of that was to support CRESS and like kind of gave a roadmap how CRESS could move forward. Um, and then there was seventh gen who worked more with the community members and they did a report, which is how we're kind of where DEI came from. And, um, you know, the conversations about lack of trust in the police department with some of the community members. So there's, it's all kind of, this is all kind of like a trickle down. I don't, I think that's right. Trickle down from the community safety working groups recommendations and then you have what happened on July 5th, which only, you know. So um, I'm happy to email those to you tomorrow. They can also be found if you just go to amersma.gov. And if you go to your government and it should say like boards and committees A through Z and then C Community Safety Social Justice Committee has links that bring you to all of those reports. So there are three, four reports total. There's a part A, part B from the Community Safety 
working group and then there's the leap report and seventh gen report so that just is kind of like the background from where all of this is coming from great i feel really guilty that uh, my question took up so much air time so but i really appreciate your thorough responses it's helpful. No, don't don't feel guilty at all ronnie um, I think your question is important because it raises, um, it helps to understand, and I had to read all these reports to start to get it myself, that there's a very complex sort of context in Amherst. There are historic relationships. There are perceptions. Uh, like after George Floyd, people told me that they were really shocked not only by that it happened, but they never imagined something like that. Anything even close to that would happen here. And then the July 5th incident happened. People were like, oh my God, not our nice police. Um, and then I think that there's just not, there's a whole part of Amherst that's just, that's nice. And believes in the right things and says the right things, but just wasn't very clued into what's going on. And what these reports did was that they provided data, qualitative and quantitative data that said, this is what's going on in our community. And I think that now I'm going into my own theory. I think, you know, we were asking, I was asking like, you've got it all here. You've got the experts. Why don't you follow the recommendations? Well, it's because there's more to it. I think all of that really touched people in this community very deeply, uh, that this feeling of, is this really us? Are our police doing this to our kids just because they're Cambodian or African-American or whatever? So I've heard some of that kind of discussion. I think it's really very complicated actually here, even though when I moved here, you know, I thought, oh, progressive Amherst. But it's it's changing. It's demographically it's changing in very big ways, or change started changing before I got here, obviously. But it's changing from its historic roots, and I think there are lots of things going on with power structures in this town, which makes this a great commission to be part of. Thank you for that, Ronnie. Oh, so. Sorry, I was pontificating again. Oh my God, you have to shut me up. But so what I was getting to was the police, because when we got to the end, you know, Cress was talking about what they're doing, and there was nothing there about taking over um, the component of police work that dealt with nonviolent calls. And that's really what I understood to be their mandate. And because they're new and they're doing all this, finding their own pathway, um, it's, I don't know, I felt like that conversation wasn't very full because it happened late at night. And that's why the police action piece got lost in the bigger piece about racism. Yeah, that's, that's great to point out, Ronnie. I think, I think you are correct that. The conversation definitely got cut off and I think yeah towards some point of the night I think all of our minds start to drift off somewhere and so that definitely does happen. So I have one more question I don't nobody needs to respond now but it would be wonderful for me if there was some data um, I know in Portland there was a study done of all the reasons that police responded to calls. And it turns out that 13% were crime related and 87% were not. And so that gave to me like a perfect analysis of, okay, you can reduce the police budget by 87% and move over that, the, that work to the equivalent of Cress in, in Portland. Um, it would be great for me to know in Amherst, what do police officers respond to? What does their work consist of? And what is it? What does nonviolent police activity, you know, mean? Like, uh, is it delineated? Are there ten subject areas? Are there a hundred subject areas? Um, were the folks in Crest hired to address a hundred different things? Or, yeah. So that kind of background would be really helpful for me. If yeah, it exists, it does. It's in the leap report. So the about twenty percent of the calls are calls that um, deal with more 
social work aspects of the job, right? Responding to um, things that are non-criminal, so. I'm just amazed it's exactly the opposite. Amherst and Portland, Oregon, wow. Anybody else have anything? Nope, Pamela? Yeah, um, I think that that if you were to look deeply at the analysis of the work of the police department, it would probably look very similar to, to Portland. Um, it, no police officer in Amherst has used a weapon in what, a decade, right? Um, so what is serious crime here is, you know, very, can, is really very different. So I, I think, um, and, I have not reviewed them, but I'm told that deep somewhere on the police department uh, website are all of that, those statistics and stuff, but they're also in the legal joint. Thank you, Pamela. Yeah, I think that in this conversation, the highlight of this commission and um, its work is to be almost in the know and to kind of keep asking these questions and keep kind of figuring out what is to Deborah's point, who is the person that you kind of need to go poke in that situation because there are a lot of avenues that you can take and some are more fruitful than others. And so with that, I think that we can move on to the next agenda items. So we have an update for bylaws. I uh, don't think there's much of an update, but Pamela? There isn't much of an update. I did share with our town council all of the suggestions that came from the subcommittee. So that was Philip, Ronnie, and Tyler. Um, I had a initial conversation with her and I'm hoping to try to get her attention again um, because I think it, you know there's a real need for us to try to finalize this this year to um, update the bylaws. So um, uh, the town manager did tell me that this is the busiest time of year for their law firm because they represent like I think over 200 cities and towns in, in the Commonwealth. Um, so it's, uh, it's hard to get her attention, but she is aware of our needs and I did send her that information. Tyler? I wonder whether with regards to the bylaws, since it sounds like they haven't looked at it in depth yet. So it, there might be some merit in doing another round of review of the bylaw uh, before we get it out, just to make sure that we didn't miss anything, maybe even broader council review since the bylaw, we made the changes with just three of us. We didn't even really uh, spend as much time going over all of those changes since we were trying to get it out. But if they're not really looking at it thoroughly anyways, then I wonder if there's time for us to look over it again, since most likely this bylaw won't get amended again for another 5, 10, 15 years. So we might as well, if we have more time to work on it, make it more robust. So I, I think the answer to that is yes. Um, um, and the one thing that I would say that the subcommittee focused on was the language of the bylaw. I don't, I don't know if any decisions were made um, about the procedure that the HRC would um, follow, and other than that, like the suggestions that I had sort of made um, um, during the HRC re re retreat. So, so I, yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, I, I like that idea. And I think, Ronnie, I think I saw a thumbs up from you um, as well. I think if all three of us could find time with the, um, Jen or Pamela or both of you um, to kind of go through that, that'd be great. I would really make time for that. All right. I will send out an email about that after this let's see um anybody have anything else about bylaws all 
No. All right. So the next thing that we have on our agenda is a letter that we were asked to look over and see if we wanted to support. Although I don't think that we are going to get that accomplished tonight, being that there's not a quorum. So I will um, get back to the supporters and just let them know that on our end, we did not have a quorum. And so to move forward with it, because I think it was time sensitive on their end for um, us to sign on to it. The next one that I have is the Youth Hero Awards and the basketball tournament. So um, I believe everybody is new on this call and may not be familiar with the Youth Hero Awards. So what we do at the Youth Hero Awards is kind of um, highlight our youth in town that have done um, any type of social justice type thing. We've had people like sell um, cupcakes and donate to the local um, survival center, have people created um, like local library type things. And so an array of things, it's really a way just to highlight our youth and encourage them to keep on, you know, becoming the next human rights commissioners or the next people on the CSSJC committees. So um, those nominations come in. Uh, I believe they are live right now. I did see some stuff and I know that I did share it on social media. So um, if you know any youth or know of um, someone who works with youth that would like to highlight anybody and nominate them for a Youth Hero Award, um, it's a fun little ceremony. There's a write-up that happens. Liz Haygood usually um, does that write up and will hopefully be announcing them that day. Um, Jen, you have your hand up. Um, I, I do have a different update about it, but I just wanted to say since she's not here and Juliana has left the commission, she actually gave her resignation that the 10th was going to be her last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, but somebody should nominate her as well. Victor's already been nominated. And I actually have received the majority of the nominations are for the students who wrote the article in the graphic. So there's like 60 of them. and that have you know i've received 60 nominations for that group and then somewhere in all of that are you know like victors and there's a a classroom at fort river so i kind of have to weed through those but um it's great it's a great day in events um the update on it is that we are also going to work with the race amity um day the, the, the organizers for that to be included in the Youth Hero Awards portion of it or throughout the day. So it's really um, a full day of entertainment. So there's like a couple of different components because there's the basketball tournament piece, which it's like, how does that fit in? So prior to last year, the Youth Hero Awards were really pretty, it was pretty small. And so last year we worked with the Harry, no, the Julius Ford Harriet Tubman, Tubman Healthy Living, Living. Community. Mm -hmm. And they did a basketball tournament at the same time that we did the Human Rights Youth Hero Awards. And it really created this nice community event where just people who you wouldn't have necessarily seen next to each other eating and laughing and dancing were all together. And so, you know, that is community and how we like to define or how I like to define defined community. So um, it's a kind of, and also that basketball tournament prior to last year was being supported by just two community members, but yet it fed a lot of, you know, families for the day. And so it's kind of a way to take some of the burden off of the organizers of the original basketball and also highlight our youth all kind of in the same time. And then because we're having it on 11th, which is Race Amity Day, or the celebration of Race Amity Day, um, we kind of bumped heads with their events. And so we've now decided to just combine the whole day because a lot of what Race Amity Day is doing is it coincides with the youth um, hero awards and the mission is very much the same. So yep. this is June 11th, starts at 10, we end at five. We'll also have departments there. You know, it's a full day lunch, basketball games, kids activities, Amherst Recreation will be there with, you know, 
different sports activities for the kids and arts and craft and the library will be there. So uh, it's, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, we get people from other departments to come out and so people can realize like town employees, we, we are people too, right? Like we like to do things like barbecue and have, you know, play basketball and stuff like that too. So. Yeah, it was a, last year was a full day of really celebration. And I think uh, Jen hit the nail on the head there with that. A lot of community members that you would not expect coming together and just having a conversation and watching a game and, you know, then highlighting youth in our community. It's, it's a really great event and a really good day. Um, and I mean, you can't go wrong when you're giving out free food. So <laughs> that's always a, a crowd bringer in, but yes. Uh, so if everybody can mark their calendars for that um, day, June, I was going to say July, not July, June 11th. <laughs> And I would just add that the event starts at 10, but we always need help setting up. So, um, and then the event is probably over by four, but we always need a little bit of help cleaning up, right? So. Location, you didn't mention the Mill River, yeah. 95 Montague Road. I've got that memorized now. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> Deborah. Yeah, thanks. Um, Jennifer, you've already trained me. I looked this up and I found the document but it doesn't say what age youth is. So who's eligible for the award? Oh no, well, it, if I thought somewhere in the, in the nomin not in the nomination form, but in the opening letter, it should state that kids from, there are three, you know, one from each elementary, you know, kids from each elementary school, kids from the middle school and kids from the high school. And so even if the kids are living in Leverett and Shutesbury, if they're at Amherst High, they too are also um, eligible to be, to be youth heroes. So basically I would say just to be safe under 19, maybe 20, right? It's a great question. And thank you for clarifying that, Jen. Uh, as far as Juliana, I'll take your Juliana's nomination. I definitely think she should be nominated for her time with us. Any other questions on that? Are some members able to come to that? I don't want to put you on the spot or anything. I know June is a little bit away, but. I plan to come, it's on my calendar. Perfect, awesome. All right, and then the following week, is it the following week, Jen? Yep, the following week we have June 10th. So it'll be July, or June. I don't know why I keep wanting to say July. June 11th. June 11th will be Youth Hero Award. And then the following week week will be uh, June 10th. And that um, day, are we doing anything that Saturday with the Ancestral Bridges walk or anything? Um, no, we, I mean, I would suggest that members go to support the Ancestral Bridges equally as they come to support the Jubilee on the Common. And so the two events are separate, but we support each other, you know, through the weekends and so that it becomes a, a you know, a weekend worth of events. So I also know that Amherst Cinema will be showing um, fences for free at the, at the theater. Um, and I I don't know what else they're doing for the plan, but I believe that they're having an event. They're they're showing a, a, a movie on Sunday. So it's like a, an event's worth events all weekend um, with the Juneteenth uh, theme. Yeah, and Juneteenth will be the 19th, which is the Monday of that week. So, and that will be on the town common. Um, last year was a, really great um, event that I will give kudos to Jen for. I know that the Human Rights Commission name was on it, but Jen, you really pulled off that event. And so thank you so much. Um, there was performances and food trucks happening. It was, it was just a really fun and lively event there. And we plan to have the same type of setup as well. Um, do we know vendors that are coming yet or do we still have to reach out? 
So this year I have someone to work with me. Um, Laverne has been so graciously Perfect. working with me and, um, you know, reaching out to the different craft vendors and the different food vendors. Um, and so, you know, it'll be very much the same. You know, the theme is always support black businesses. So one side of the common is lined with craft vendors who, you know, black and Afro indigenous and Afro Latino um, craft vendors. And the other side is lined with foods from black restaurant, you know, Afro-American Afro restaurants and Caribbean restaurants. So it, you know, and you're buying the food. It's the one time that we host an event where people need to purchase the food. Um, there's lots of reasons. One, we could never purchase enough food to free to feed everybody on the common um, in the in that way. But and we would actually be doing a disservice to the food vendors because they could make more money if they sold their own food. Um, to be noted, like if people, if it's a hardship for people and they're hungry and they need to eat and they don't have the money, I'm sure like they could come see um, myself or Laverne or one of the organiz organizers and we can work something out. But the general, and I don't know if I should really say that, but the general feel is that we're, we're people who need to, to buy the food to support the businesses because that's what the day is scheduled for, right? Supporting businesses and letting their names get out there. Um, unfortunately, they're not, most of the businesses are out of Springfield, which that's a wonderful thing, but we have to get them from some, you know, from Connecticut, from Springfield, because we here, Amherst, Hadley, Northampton, don't have as many to support the event on its own, so. Great. And then, uh... DJ wise, is it going to be Pete and yeah. Yeah. So Pete is our, our annual MC. So Pete is also um, DJ. He's a, he's a, he is the head facilities um, person over at Wildwood. So it's really nice to have him because the kids get to see him in this whole entire different context, which is like another really good way of bringing community together. Like, oh, I saw Pete as, a, you know, so it's just really nice. He, he really likes working with the kids and seeing the kids. So he will be our master MC. He will also be DJing along with Ben, who's also a DJ. But you guys didn't know that one either. See? And so um, it's just, it's just a great, good feeling day you know the Amherst gospel choir will come and sing and help open us up and uh we have some great performances that are um that are coming the high school is going to come their dance team will come and do a step show which I'm so excited about yeah uh, I love a good step show I mean it's just fantastic and so we have a, a main headliner I'm not ready to announce them yet but we have our main headliner and so that's really great that you know and as the event keeps happening this is our third year and it gets bigger and bigger we get a lot more support behind it and so that's also really helpful as well um so i'm just super excited and then i'm going on vacation after juneteenth because i don't know it's a lot of stuff yeah that'll be good do we have the uh 54 regiment yeah um i so the majority of them are in springfield so okay. i know that they're going to be here for for Saturday. And so because we're not the direct next day, we're still working on those kind of um, details. And it, and it would be nice for them to do a kind of performance in the same way that they do for ancestral bridges. So we have to really figure that out. We're also doing, I've been working with the curator at the Jones Library and Sarah Barr from Amherst College and Anika Lopes on a timeline of the of the black community in Amherst, you know, since Amherst is defined from Hadley in 1752, I think, which is something I learned. It's like, that's why I love this job because you learn something new every day. But like, I didn't know like South Hadley, North, we were all part of Hadley, right? And then okay. we, we all divided off. Um, and so we're just gonna kind of do a timeline. The goal is to have, um, you know, instead of having a program that people get to go home with, they have like either a little passport. I can't figure out if it's a passport or a green book where they get to stamp, you know, each time period that they've been and they visited and then they go to the next one and they get to stamp. So it's a self-guided tour. It's really meant for those people who we don't necessarily anticipate coming to the common, but they went to grab a slice, they heard the music, they came over. And so that way they have a full explanation of what Juneteenth actually is versus, oh, they're celebrating Juneteenth, right? Like this is what we are celebrating here. Um, and so that's, I'm really excited about that, so. Yeah, no, that's that's a really great thing, and um, 
just to be the chair for a moment that is a big essential in our bylaws of the education piece in town. So I fully support that. <laughs> Anybody have any questions for Juneteenth? No? All right, well, mark your calendars on that day. June I would 19th. just I Go would ahead. just add that it's a really um, hands on deck day. So as many people who can come and participate, that is greatly needed. I think Philip and I for a few years have, and then along with Pamela have been holding down a lot of these events that have hundreds of people. And then it's like the three of us. So um, it would be great if folks can come and bring your friends too, right? Like to help yeah. set up my children come, Philip's wife comes, Pamela's friends come to help us all kind of set up because it's a lot of work. Um, I'm so sorry, but I have to travel that day. There's like no getting away from it. I was very active in Juneteenth last year when with working with the Historical Museum, actually, and enjoyed it very much. And I do feel very bad. I reserved the weekend. I actually postponed things so I wouldn't travel till Monday. And I think I didn't have, I had it in my mind that it was the weekend, not the Monday. So... Yeah, yeah June, I feel sad that I will miss it, but I can't change things now. Um, so I'm afraid I won't be able to help on that day, but I can try to help before or if needed. No, no and, um, I guess just to really uh, acknowledge really quick, um, Juliana too, why I think she'd be going back to the Youth Hero Awards. Uh, great nomination is because she did put together along with Jen the um, AAPI month celebration that we had a couple weeks ago. And that was a really big turnout and a uh, few community members came to me. And I think with all these events, a lot of community members come to me and say, it's so nice that the town's putting on this event. Like I feel really seen, I feel really validated and like knowing that like my culture is being represented even one um elderly person at the aapi month said oh this is great that the town's doing it and isn't expecting like us to do it for ourselves i think that that messaging is is really strong and like so needed <laughs> like for our town just to have these events and to jen's point like it, ju it just becomes a regular thing to where more and more people are helping out sponsor wise for different organizations, different committees, different whoever. So that way all the burden doesn't just fall on a, a few individuals. We like to joke, uh, me and my partner that um, she's an honorary HRC member with some of the events she helps out with there. <laughs> but yes, if, if you can make it, that'd be wonderful. Um, and yes, that'd be great. One other thing that I was going to say about did i say hand go up or no no hand. okay um before we kind of close out and go to public comment i do see one person in the public so maybe um is that the reality of the hrc since i have been on has struggled to get a quorum as you see tonight on the call the uh, the three newest members uh, are, are here, much appreciated. And we have a potential new member coming in, um, Deborah, who will also be here. So we are trying to fill up the seats. We do have a lot of vacancies coming up. Um, Juliana um, is gone. Cedric will be done. I will be leaving. Um, and I don't know about Liz and Ben. I, I know their, their term is coming up, but I don't know that if they have signed on to be back on and Victor I imagine will be leaving because he is going to be leaving the area soon because he will be graduating. Um, Ronnie? I wonder if there's a forum to publicize our work and who we are to attract more candidates. This is so important especially now this work is really important and I don't know how many people are aware if you go to the town site you know there are dozens of these things. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I actually don't know um, if there's something we could put a little little article about, or I don't know what. I mean, I'm yeah. not a communications expert, but 
So I always go to writing a piece in the newspaper because that's what I do. But I wonder if we could give some thought to, and if somebody wants to take some time to talk with me about it um, so I can help, um, I'd be willing to help do that. But I think we need to make the work of this commission known so that people want to join it and they're not just feeling like, uh, okay, I'll join that one. Right, no, that's that's a good point. I mean, that was one thing um, when I came on that I assessed and saw and really tried to make the HRC known in town. I know that um, recently we, I guess this was a few months ago, actually, in the Indy, the Amherst Indy, we did an article, um, Ben and I, just to kind of discuss and talk about work. And I don't know how much headway that got or anything, but I think that that's a great idea to try and see if, we can access more members through that. And I know that through the town in general that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jen or Pamela, um, getting committee members for anything right now seems to be a hard task to do. Um, I had another, an idea just now, which is that we're having these events where all these people are coming. Maybe we should say this is sponsored or co-sponsored by whatever the appropriate term is by, you know, Human Rights Commission, um, if you're interested, talk to one of us, go to the website, join us, something like that. I don't know what the exact message would be, but sure. if people are coming to our events, that seems like a place to recruit. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I know on uh, all of our advertisement, we do put that it is co-sponsored by the Human Rights um, Commission, if not put on by the Human Rights Commission. Pamela, you were going to say something? So at the AAPI um, event, um, Angela, who like Jen is a community participation officer, was there at a table um, promoting this board and other boards, but I think we could definitely do some additional promotion. Um, the most recent round of, of uh, individuals to apply uh, what, we were slated to have four interviews. Uh, the fourth person dropped out, but there were three interviews, and and um, and so there was there was some interest from individuals in joining joining the committee. But I think that certainly we could do more to attract other people. Yeah, definitely. And I know that, um, and this is just future knowledge, just to knowledge dump from my time on this commission is that um, at one point we were a seven member commission. So that um, then delegates a quorum to be four members on a call. Um, we increased to nine because we were having issues with getting a quorum to see if that could make it more um, efficient. But then your quorum number then turned into five members as opposed to four. And so looking over those things at various points would be great for the future of this commission. And then alas with that, and I know that uh, everybody is new, but just to give you a little uh, insight to my time as chair is that I joined officially in July of 2021 and became co-chair of December of 2021. So it was a very fast turnaround, but a very uh, needed thing to happen. So with my departure, co-chair will be opening up. So just something to think about in the back of the mind there. With that, uh, let's go to public comment. We have anybody in the public that would like to speak? If you'd like to speak, go ahead and raise your hand. I am not seeing a hand. So then we will be ending our meeting 748. Thank you everybody for joining. Um, our next meeting will be the third Wednesday of June, which is that going to be the 21st after? Yep. All right. Well, I guess we will see a lot of each other that, that week there. <laughs> oh, the right. Yep.
Thanks so much for your kind welcome, everyone. Yes, thank you for joining us. Um, Laverne, can, I mean, people are welcome to stay on, but I, I think we were, I just wanted to check in with you about a meeting time, because I know. Oh, yeah, we scheduled it for tomorrow at three. <laughs> I think I had today at three. Oh, really? No, I have tomorrow. Okay, let me go back to my calendar. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm like, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, no, you're right, tomorrow. Okay. I thought I missed a meeting with you and I was like all over my email. Like she would have emailed and been like, are we meeting? Oh, yeah, and I, I didn't see meeting. it. <laughs> yeah, cause um, yeah, so I'll call some more people, but like people aren't calling me back. So, but we'll talk about um, it. Yeah, it gets a little tricky. There's, there's, um, 